Hi, Russ of Aquarimax here. In today's installment of the Isopod Care Guide, we'll be discussing common isopod pests and how to help prevent and control them. First, there are some guidelines that can help prevent isopod pests in general. The first is to sanitize leaves, decor, hides, and substrate prior to use. I heat mine at 200 Fahrenheit for half an hour. I want to stress that I recognize that there are pros and cons to sanitizing substrate in this way. It probably does take longer for a microbial balance to be established, but it also goes a long way towards preventing quite a few species of unexpected guests, some of which could prey on, parasitize, or outcompete your isopods. The next tip is to avoid overfeeding supplemental food. A small colony of isopods can only handle so much supplemental food, so whatever remains after the isopods have had their fill is essentially an open invitation to various pests. If your isopods can't finish the supplemental food you offer them within a day or so, reduce the amount of food that you're feeding. As your isopod colony grows, you can increase the quantity of food you offer gradually. It is also important to recognize that most pest issues occur with newer isopod cultures. Fully established cultures with higher populations have far fewer issues. An established culture with a bug pest problem might need some husbandry adjustments. Before I go on to some specific isopod pests and how to deal with them, I want to thank my patrons at Patreon. You help me do so much more than I could do without your help. And as the Aquarimax Patreon family grows, the possibilities increase with it. If you're interested in becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month, check out the link at the end of the video. And now, let's talk about some specific common isopod pests. Probably the most annoying isopod pests, and possibly the most common, are fungus gnats. If you've ever kept houseplants in pots of soil, had a terrarium or vivarium with any kind of somewhat moist substrate in it, or you've kept isopods, you've probably encountered fungus gnats. They seek out moist organic matter such as leaf litter and compost, but what's worse, they also seem quite attracted to the eyes and noses of humans. One of the most important things you can do to combat fungus gnats is to add springtails to new enclosures, even before you add the isopods. My favorite species of springtail for this is Sonella curvaceta. It can thrive in the moisture, humidity, and ventilation tolerances of any common hobby isopod and will outcompete many pests, as well as most other springtails for that matter. As with other pests, don't overdo it with supplemental food and limit the damp leaf litter in the enclosure to an amount that the isopods can handle fairly quickly. You can cover ventilation holes with chiffon mesh or with breathable medical tape. The specific medical tape I use with good results is called Transpore by 3M, and there's a link down in the description. This can help keep fungus gnats out, but keep in mind that the fine mesh works really well in enclosures that are otherwise very tightly sealed. But enclosures with a looser lid, like our beloved six quart Sterilite tubs, fungus gnats usually find their way in through the gap. Also, if you have the lid off and a gravid fungus gnat gets in, you've got gnats. Sufficient ventilation is also important in combating fungus gnats. I've been experimenting with enclosures without covering vent holes, but with providing more cross ventilation. One example of good cross ventilation is in these wonderful enclosures from tarantula cribs. They seem to work really well. And despite the fact that the vent holes are not covered, I don't have a big problem with fungus gnats in these enclosures, especially once the isopods have built up a good population. I'll put a link in the description to tarantula crib enclosures if you're interested. Keeping a good moisture gradient with the dry side pretty dry and a good area of moss that's uh, not a lot of damp leaves will help against fungus gnats as well. I find that fly ribbons and or other sticky traps will effectively help reduce fungus gnats, and I'll put a link to some of those in the description as well. In a previous video, I talked about mosquito bits and how using those can help prevent and control fungus gnats. They definitely do appear to make a positive difference against fungus gnats, but there's some evidence that they might have a negative impact on some invertebrates long term. We're talking a year or more. And while I'm still not sure whether or not is, this is the case with isopods, I hesitate to recommend them without more information. Finally, 
It's important to remember that as your isopod and springtail populations grow, fungus gnats will simply tend to be less of an issue. Now, let's move on to what may be the most feared of isopod pests, mites. First of all, it's important to note that there are many, many different species of mites out there. Mites are tiny arachnids, and some are harmful to other organisms. For example, in the reptile hobby, people sometimes have issues with parasitic mites that attach themselves to snakes, lizards, and so on. Not only are these mites harmful to reptiles, but they can be very difficult to eradicate. Fortunately, the mites that show up most often in isopod closures do not appear to be parasitic, although some can be a nuisance. Grain mites are attracted to moist organic matter, like fungus gnats, so they often show up in isopod enclosures, especially new ones. These mites are kind of roundish in shape, tend to move quite slowly, and are kind of pale in color. They are so common in homes and even in the foods that we offer to our isopods that they can appear seemingly out of nowhere. They can breed extremely fast if there's plenty of food, and the swarms are usually regarded as unsightly. Well, they can overwhelm enclosures of some creatures, like mealworms or fruit flies. They don't seem to be as much of an issue with isopods. Isopods likely provide some competition. There are various other species of mites, some of which are faster moving than grain mites and not quite as rotund. Some of these will actually prey upon other mite species, including grain mites, but they will also prey upon springtails, so they're a mixed blessing. One of the positives is that these types of mites do not appear to harm isopods. There are also some soil mites that don't really appear to cause any problems for springtails or isopods and do not appear to be particularly prolific, so basically they can be ignored. To help prevent and control annoying mites, good husbandry is key. Again, get those springtails into your isopod enclosures as soon as possible and avoid that overfeeding of supplemental foods. Young grain mites are so small that covering your ventilation holes with fine mesh is unlikely to do much to keep them out. Fortunately, a well-maintained, well-populated isopod colony is unlikely to suffer a, a true infestation of grain mites. If they're in there, they're in such small numbers that they're usually not noticeable. Another group of pests that can show up in an isopod culture are isopods. Yes, you heard me correctly. One species of isopod can sometimes become a pest in another isopod enclosure. Trichorhinotomentosa, the dwarf white isopod, Porcelionides prunosus, the powder blue isopod, and Atlantosha floridana, the Florida fast isopod, have a reputation for showing up uninvited in the enclosures of other isopod species stacked near or particularly under them. A few uninvited individuals of one species in a colony of another species may seem harmless enough at first, but over time, competition will tend to occur. Small prolific species like the ones I just mentioned are particularly known for outcompeting most other species over time. I have a couple of suggestions to help avoid this sort of isopod versus isopod ecological warfare. The first is to keep the containers of these species at some distance from and preferably below your other isopods. My dwarf whites and powders are each on shelves far from any other isopod species. My other tip is to avoid cross-contamination. For example, if you put your hands in a dwarf white isopod bin, make sure to wash your hands thoroughly before working in or touching other isopod enclosures, as all it takes is one tiny parthenogenic manka stowing away on your hands for a few seconds to establish an entire colony. I figured this out very early on in my isopod keeping, but before I did, I could have sworn those little critters were teleporting. So, I'd say that these are by far the most common isopod pests. If you've dealt with another, or you have another tip for dealing with one of the pests that I've just discussed, please let me know down in the comments. If you haven't seen the rest of my isopod care guide playlist, please make sure to check it out. And thanks for watching. I post videos every Tuesday and Friday, all on aquarium and vivarium pets, especially isopods. Feel free to share, rate, comment, check out my Patreon, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then tap the bell so you don't miss my next video.